show. All right. Um, so I have been doubling in hardware for the last like four years already, and slowly but slowly it has consumed my life. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about it, what it's like, and why you should also, you know, have your life consumed by hardware games. And um, yeah, so I'm going to basically show. Ah, no, too slow. This is me. Um, just uh, briefly, I live in London so far. Let's see if I'm going to be kicked out soon. But uh, I've got a computer science background, not an engineering background. Um, did mobile games for a while, and now I'm into experimental stuff. And that's what I'm mostly going to talk about. So I'm going to say why you should all do it now, why it's better time than ever. Um, then give some examples who is making hardware games, uh, who's playing them, and I'm going to talk about my own game and uh, you know, what you can do eventually when you have a hardware game. Um, uh, not become rich, that's not part of it, spoiler. <laughs> um, all right, so basically, first of all, maybe a, a quick question. Who of you doesn't know what an Arduino is? Everyone, that's amazing. One person, okay, I'll explain it for you later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and oh, who doesn't know what line wobbler is? So a few people. Okay, it's good. We'll have a demonstration later. Um, uh, so why now, basically? Um, the, so it's because um, wait, no, yes. Um, basically, everything is better now. So it's easier to use. Uh, they're cheaper. They're easier to get. Um, there is better like iterations out there, and there's large communities, both offline and online. Um, so just some examples, so like for easy to use hardware, there's the Makey Makey, which is basically you don't need to program at all, so you just have this thing, and you put wires into a banana, and suddenly it's a keyboard. So it does left and right, and space bar, and uh, I think you can even change what it does. Um, there's little bits for basically for kids, so they can just kind of uh, snap things together. I think I have a slide on that as well. Um, they're easier to buy. Uh, you can buy it uh, either super easily and it arrives next day or from China and it takes longer but it's super cheap. Um, there's like third and fourth generation hardware now. So like everyone is making their own devices on Kickstarter, selling them there. Uh, that leads to huge security issues but we're not going to talk about this because we're into games, right? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so there's a lot of communities. So in London, for example, there's the London Hex Space, which is amazing. So you can do all this stuff. Basically, I'll do all my stuff there, and I'll show you some pictures of that later. And online communities are really good as well. So there's the uh, Arduino website, and it has like this massive forum. And basically, if you want to do anything related to, like, put a sensor here, and how do I do this? Someone will have had this problem before, and they have documented it, and there's code, and they show you exactly where to put the wires, which is really cool. Um, so this is like little bits, for example. They're really expensive, um, but they're really easy to use. Um, and they're color-coded, so blue is power, uh, green is output, and uh, pink is um, input. So it's like, a, you know, if you press the button, then the light will come on, and there's like a little buzzer here. Um, so th there's like a lot of these elements. You can snap them together. Um, but I think like this kit alone costs like 50 pounds or something, so it's, it's not cheap. But it's super easy to get started. So this is like on the one end, and on the other end there is uh, more advanced stuff. Like for example, I love this Teensy 3.2, which is a type of Arduino, and I can you know talk about it for hours. Um, but um, basically, it's like an advanced, super powered, tiny Arduino. So it's like super small, like my thumbs here. Um, so it's it's better, it's smaller, it's faster, and more accurate. Has got more ports. Uh, I use it for everything, um, but it needs a bit more work. So you need to kind of solder it yourself. To, uh, to a platform, so there's like some more handy work required before you can get started. And um, so just as an example, I mean, there's not gonna be much code in here. Um, just an example how easy it is to get started with LED strips, for example, that you can display anything on. Um, it's only like three lines of code. You say, okay, we add some LEDs, um, and then we say, okay, they should be um, green, and then we show them. So that's all you need to do. And then the rest is like, you know, you need to include, say, how many LEDs there are. So which pin you connected to, and they're all numbered from one to, I don't know, 30. And so in this case, we have it on three. Um, and that's how you get like interactive LED powered displays uh, already. I mean, obviously, you need to do a bit smarter stuff than just making them green, um, but it's up to you. Um, Cool. So once you've got your own game, what do you do with them? So there's like a lot of different things, but so far there is, um, actually I talk about first who is making those. Um, so there is no big kind of uh, groups that make hardware games exclusively now. So it's like a very niche thing. So a lot of small, like individual people, um, small teams, 
um, as side projects, they make these. Um, actually, this one was uh, a game on a sewing machine that was made by, uh, who was it? Some of you know. know. It's like, I think it's, um, it's a Disney thing even from a university collaboration. Um, that was at Alt Control GDC this year. And I'm going to go through a couple other games which I really like um, from this year and the last. Probably most of you know this one. Um, it's Beasts of Balance, uh, made also in London. Uh, so Alex Fleetwood, George Buckingham, and others are involved in this one. And it's, uh, it's a mix of a physical game and a digital game. So uh, it's like you stack things on a scale, and then they appear in the digital world, and uh, they do things, they interact with each other. And uh, of course, at the same time, you need to be uh, focused that it doesn't fall over, and um, then the game would be over. Um, but this is a very interesting example, and i come back to that later, but they totally developed this from scratch through Kickstarter, through mass manufacture in China in uh, less than two years, which is uh, absolutely stunning. Um, then uh, there's other games. Um, this is for my friend Jerry, and he made the game called Choosatron, which is like a tiny receipt printer, but it's actually a choose-your-own-adventure game. Um, so you have these four buttons, and you, you know, the, the receipt printer prints out your story, and you read it as it comes out, and you can press a button, and it you know, follows that storyline, and then in the end, you can rip it off and take it home. So it's kind of a nice little touch that you can take on your home st your story that you made. And there's like 100 stories or so on these little machines. Um, so Jerry, yes. Um, this one is really cool, and it's kind of slightly less known. Um, it's called Flip Paper. Um, uh, by, uh, it's made in France, and you can't really see it here, but what it is, is basically you have this p uh, piece of paper here, and you draw on it with, with ink, uh, with, with pens, and then um, there's a scanner on the top that scans in what you drew, recognizes what you've done, and projects the same lines onto it again, and then you can play pinball with those lines. So like each color does something else, so red is like a bouncer, uh, green is like an accelerator, and blue um, spawns flipper uh, pedals. And then, so you can say, okay, this doesn't really work, so we can add a line here, and you scan it again, and later on you can also take your pinball thing home with you, or you can display what you did. So it's a mix of art and playing games and collaboration. It's a really cool thing. Unfortunately, there's uh, actually, just to go into it a little bit, um, this is like a really heavy machine. So it's like, I think it's 180 kilograms. It's like a cubic meter to ship. And uh, I think like to ship from France to, to London would be like 3,000 euros or something. So. This is the main problem with, with hardware games in general, I guess, that, that you can't really get it somewhere. So I wanted to get those guys to submit to Alt Control GDC, which is like a nice little exhibition in San Francisco. But they don't pay for anything. So they just, uh, you know, like admission is its own reward in there. It's like once you get in, you have a big audience, you know. It's like, a, um, but they don't pay ever for any shipment. And like to America, I, I can't even imagine how much it would cost, like probably 10,000. Ridiculous. Um, this is a game by, by two Argentinians. Um, it's a four player game, four plus one player. So four players play on the screen and do things, jump and run games, different ones. And the fifth player down here, he messes with the other players. So you can scale down time, I can kind of make the screen wobble, you can kind of, uh, you know, do all kinds of things. And it's like usually to, to annoy the other players a little bit, but it's, it's, it's very much fun. Um, yes, Dobotone, that's what it's called. And there's a lot of other people doing it as well, um, all over the planet. Uh, Alistair Edgenson, you might know, he's like often down in London, he's uh, living up north, doing kind of cool hands-on games as well. And there's a lot of other people. Uh, yeah. So where are those games made? So there isn't really that many uh, con like gathering places where you can make them yet. Um, two exceptions maybe is the Alt Control Game Jam that's also related to this Alt Control GDC thing that I talked about. The weird thing about this one is it's, it's a hardware game jam, but it's online. So you make your thing and then nobody can play it. So it's a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you need to make a good video about it basically uh, and then show what you've done. Um, and yeah, that was on just like a couple of months ago. This just happened as well. Uh, Zoom Machines Festival is in France. Um, I've got a shirt on. I didn't manage to go to this one, unfortunately. Uh, but last year, I made uh, with some friends, I made a game which had an actual French kitchen knife on a motor. Uh, it's called Knife to Meet You. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a photo of it later. It's, it's, a, it's, it's about pain in games. So we, it's, it's very good. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit dangerous because the, this is an actual knife. Like some of the French guys, you just, oh, you took one out of his drawers and we drilled a hole in it and put it on this servo, you know, like this little motor. And you have to hold your finger in as long as you can. Uh, it's very good. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, yeah, so these two are like basically dedicated events for hardware games, but in general you can make them anywhere. So at any game jam or you know, just by yourself. So for example, last year, no this year actually, this is from this year's uh, train jam, which is like an amazing, uh, if slightly expensive game jam, which goes from Chicago to San Francisco on a train for 52 hours. So it's like through most of America, like 5,000 kilometers, I think. And um, uh, Adriel Wallach organizes this, and it's just time, so it's just before GDC, the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco. And um, this year she managed to book the whole train, so like, it's just us. So like, if you wanna go from Chicago to San Francisco on that day, you can't anymore. I mean, you can fly, I guess, but. <laughs> um, uh, and so, yeah, I was working on, on uh, some hardware project on this jam, and you know, you just have like, it's slightly less comfortable to solder because it's all moving a little bit. <laughs> but you know, it's just a bit dangerous. <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now to like my own game, um, Line Wobbler. And uh, it's a game I made also uh, at a game jam. I made it uh, at the Exile Game Jam in Denmark two years ago, a bit more than two years, with Matthias. Uh, so this is the, the first prototype you can see here. And um, yeah, so I want to talk a bit about like how it came to be or how what, what your design process is in, in like hardware games. I mean, there isn't really that much of a design process for me, to be honest. It's more like you, you pick something you wanna work with and then through these limitations, you, you kind of are almost forced or kind of guided towards the game. So that's definitely how it happened in our game. So I can briefly show you maybe what, what Lime Wobbler is. I've got it down here. Um, so it's, um, maybe I can just pull it up like this. Yes. Yes, so this is the game now. Um, it looked very different in the beginning, and I have, uh, just so luck would have it, an older version down here as well, which i show in a minute. So, but basically, it's, it's like this weird spring, um, and it's inspired by a doorstopper spring. Um, it's got a sensor on the top here uh, that measures uh, how you bend it. And it's attached to this uh, five meter long LED strip. It was only one meter long in the beginning, but I kind of expanded it after this game jam, so I think I can even switch it on now. It's running with a battery pack that I just made two weeks ago. Um, but basically, you have to imagine the, uh, yeah, so the LED strip to be rolled out, not on like, uh, on this roll. It's very hard to play like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so basically, you, you control this little green avatar on this, on this line, and you, you're trying to find monsters on the way, which are these red lines. And if you fail, oh, let's see, this way around, then there's like this little explosion. Uh, yeah, so, and, so to attack them, you have to shake the controller like this. It's falling apart already. Yeah, so that's the game, and um, it looks a bit better when it's installed properly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this, this falling apart is actually quite, quite nice because it leads me uh, nicely into the next part. Um, it's because like, you do um, have more bugs than normal games. So normal games you have like software bugs, and uh, you know, it might break. Um, but here you have software bugs and hardware bugs. And the hardware bugs are annoying because they often just happen like a month after you made the game. Suddenly it's there and like some wire comes loose, so the front falls off. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> things happen to it. And this is very hard to debug. So this is kind of, you need to debug through experiment, like to, to exhibitions basically. So I show it at a game exhibition and it breaks in the first hour and then I sit there with my soldering iron on the, on the exhibition floor, trying frantically to get it working again. And um, yeah, so it's kind of a, it's a long learning process. And I, you know, as I said, I didn't know anything about hardware before. So it's kind of, you learn as you, as you run, basically. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's challenging, but as I said, it's, it's so much easier now because like, there's all these online forums and platforms that tell you, oh, if you use these LEDs, you have to be careful that you, know, you, you, you don't make them too long, otherwise they become, you know, there's not enough power, there's a voltage drop over the line, and you know, this and that. And um, I didn't know any of this, so you thought like, okay, if it's connected with a cable, it's connected, you know, like as a typical programmer, it's like on or off. But no, 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 if it's the cable's too long, then there's like weird internal reflections of the electrons on the wire. So you need to have kind of weird terminator resistors or something like that. And this is all this weird advanced stuff that you run into when you make games like this. Um, and for me, it's very exciting. It's like these problems that you never saw that existed and they're kind of trying to solve them slowly. And then you ask people at the hack space and they say, oh, yeah, of course, why, why didn't you think of that? You need to add a resistor here and it needs to be 150 ohms exactly. And it's like, what, why? And then it goes into like weird, uh, difficult, difficult math. And, um, but it's, it's an interesting thing to learn about. Um, so then I kind of decided to make more copies of the game. And that's kind of like a small like, production line in a way. So you see like it's, it's five of these uh, doorstopper springs here. And uh, at first I used these cut out 
PCB things, which I kind of drilled through, like with a scratched out so that it doesn't you know, connect the wrong things. Um, here are the parts. They're not really uh, important to know. It's just like in case you were wondering, these are the technical things. Um, the accelerometer is just basically the first one I found, and I, I Googled for accelerometer Arduino. And the first result was, oh yeah, use this one. It's the cheapest one, MPU 6050. It costs $2. You connect these pins to these pins. Here's some example code. Uh, and it worked, so that was it, right? So it's okay. <laughs> and um, that the LED strip, um, similar, so that you need to buy a special LED strip that is individually addressable, but you already saw the code, so you need these three lines of code or whatever uh, to make it work. Obviously, it's m more work to make it look nice later on, but I mean, that's the same with a normal game as well. Um, yes, so next. Oh yeah, so I already talked about this a bit, uh, iterations for exhibition. Um, so you have it uh, at a lot of exhibitions, or I had it, I uh, was lucky in that way, I guess. Um, so this is in Italy, at, uh, in Rome, at the Maker Fair. Um, and you know, these kids are all Italian, and I don't speak any word of Italian. They don't speak any word of English. And you know, you, there's a, they're Italian kids, so they, they're really rough, so they, you can't talk to them. It's like, <laughs> no, please be careful. <laughs> So they just, you know, and like uh, adults want to play it as well sometimes, but they, as soon as there's kids, they have no chance. It's like the kids elbow each other out of the way, kind of pull on this. And so I had these old exhibition, maybe it's even this one. No, I think it's a different one. So I have these old models. Uh, it's like very similar to this one, right? Um, and that's, uh, for example, what I noticed that went wrong, and this is like one with a doorstopper spring here. I don't know if you can all see it. I can, can look at it later as well. But you can see it, it's become very uh, wobbly. And you can see maybe on the bottom, there is a couple, um, coils of the spring that became loose. And it's basically because people just pull too strong. And you, you can't really prescribe how people play your game. You need to kind of design your game better, basically. But so that happened, and you know, it kind of became super flimsy. And then sometimes the, the wire would catch in these, and it would break entirely. Um, uh, so that's kind of, you only find that out after like you know, a week or so of, of hard playtime. But that wasn't good enough. So, you know, like it, I can show, if I show it myself and sit next to it and kind of can repair it, it's fine. But if I want to leave it alone for a while, that's impossible. So, yeah. So then, you know, need to figure out what to do after that. I mean, you can leave it at that. Um, but I thought, okay, I want to fix this. And um, so uh, I needed to find a solution. Um, so actually here you can see this was the first iteration of the spring. There was like actually uh, a shoe tree is called in English, I think. Um, it's like for old leather shoes and you put the, the spring in and this is actually my grandma's. <laughs> so uh, that also means like I think it's kind of hard to get them and you know like to, they, they have an odd shape so you're kind of really hard to mount on a table. So like I use these weird blocks of wood and uh, clamps. Um, so that wasn't really a good solution. Then I found the doorstopper springs, which are on the side. Um, but that wasn't also as good as I just showed you. So I, I needed a better solution. So I actually went um, and found uh, a small order spring factory and went to the spring factory and said, hey, I want to make a video game controller. <laughs> and they looked at me and said, what the fuck? <laughs> we make springs for doors and cars. <laughs> But uh, after a couple uh, of, of explanations, they actually warmed to the idea and said, oh yeah, yeah, you, and I learned so much about springs, it's incredible what there is, like there's different spring steels, so it's like proper spring steel, which is amazing, but it rusts, and there's stainless steel, which is slightly worse, and then the, the springiness of the spring is kind of de defined by the diameter of the steel versus the diameter of the overall spring, and uh, the length, and so it's like a lot of parameters, and I just, at first I just, oh yeah, give me like a lot of different ones, and I experimented. Um, but it was actually easier than expected. So then I, in the end, I had like 50 of those springs lying around. Uh, this is the spring I'm using now. So it has this like flat bar in the bottom so I can easily kind of attach it to some, some wood. And then it kind of um, tapers off to the top where I put the knob on. Um, the knob didn't exist either, right? So because it's, um, uh, it needs to have the sensor inside. So I need to 3D print that. Um, but that's easy to do, especially if you're like part of any hack space or maker space. They will teach you, and they're happy to teach you. And they say, okay, yeah, this is like the, the software you use. And it's fairly simple software, um, and uh, it's, it's fairly tricky, not, not very tricky. And so the same with the box, so it's a laser cut. Um, it's just like you, put the, you buy this acrylic, and this is not very expensive. It's like a pound. Um, and you, uh, there's like tab box makers online. So you just say, okay, I need this uh, five centimeters tall, uh, 15 centimeters wide and 10 centimeters deep. The acrylic is five millimeters and it spits out this pattern. And then you're basically done. You can just add a little ellipse here, like an oval here for the power cord or whatever. Um, and the laser will cut it for you in like, I don't know, five minutes. And, and you have a box, so it's very nice. 3D printing, 
Um, it's also very cool. There's now new materials for 3D printing, so there's soft materials um, um, called NinjaFlex, and they, they can kind of uh, compress, so you can make uh, flexible joints, and, or just like uh, knobs that don't kind of hurt the player. So the first iteration I had, people were complaining that their knuckles would hurt, because they would fling it and then try to grab it again, it would hit their knuckles. Um, which I actually didn't mind, you know, I like, I like a bit of pain in the games. <laughs> But you know, if it's small kids playing or something, it's like, okay, make it a bit more comfortable. Um, so that's it's a super cool material. Um, so that's what they looked, uh, assembled, so experiment with different colors, but it's um, also you can just buy different colors. Um, so yeah, finally, um, or I guess next is, where do you show this stuff when you have it? Um, and there's a few, I already mentioned this, this is all control GDC. Um, it's at the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco, which is the world's biggest games conference. Um, so it's also, uh, it's only been in the th for, there for three years. It's the fourth year next time. And um, it's, it's a very small space, so it's basically you can see all of it here, um, where they show these weird games. So like I made this one on that year, so it's like a weird slider game, and the sliders are motorized, so they kind of push and pull you. And there's other cool games. I think this one is uh, from uh, Alan Ciccone, which is also a London game dev. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I think this is David, he's still here, David Hayward. This is yours, right? The the box with the buttons. Uh, the All right. Yeah. So a lot of uh, London presence in here. It's very good, or UK presence rather. Um, so that's a really cool thing. And this year, you know, they also have a, uh, an old control award. So there's a proper award at the IGF, which is one of the most, uh, I guess, biggest uh, indie game awards there is. So you can even win prizes now with it. <laughs> but it's pretty much all you can do anyway. <laughs> um, there's other things, oh, you can show it at normal conventions, of course, so there's uh, some that are more receptive than others, um, but like a lot of uh, games conventions have now spaces for, for indie games, and a lot of those indie game spaces have space for weird games, like, like mine, for example, or other hardware games. So this was actually in Tokyo, uh, the Tokyo Game Show. That was really cool uh, to be able to show it there, and uh, it was very interesting, too, because like this language barrier came up again, but interestingly enough, with uh, Japanese players, uh, they knew all the keywords from arcades, like stage clear, because that's not translated in the Japanese games. It's always stage clear, they knew weapon, they knew enemy. And so I could explain with these three words and, uh, and then pointing and, and showing, and they would all understand. And they're all really way much better than any other audience I've seen at get, playing video games. I think they're all used by these arcade games they have, uh, still in abundance there. So I needed to actually ramp up the difficulty of the game <laughs> for them. It was quite funny. Uh, but yeah, they loved it. But it's, it's, it's tricky to show you a game if it devolves, involves a lot of language, because barely anyone speaks English. So it's very difficult if there's a, a game involving any kind of text or a uh, story-driven game. Um, they usually are received worse um, in, in Japan. Or in Asia, I guess, in general. Yeah. Um, here's a couple other ones, just briefly. Um, the Experimental Gameplay Workshop is also at, uh, at GDC. Um, Fantastic Arcade, it's an American small arcade thing. Indicate, now in Europe as well, so that was in Paris recently. Super cool, EGX and EGX Rest. Um, the Left Field Connection, organized by David, and he likes to show weird stuff. So we actually had our knife game there, <laughs> and I was very surprised it just got through because it's what, like health and safety will kick up a fuss, so we need to have sign, everyone sign a waiver. But no, it's fine. <laughs> it just flew under the radar, I think. <laughs> Um, Tokyo Game Show, Day of the Deaths is quite nice, uh, organized by Double Fine, and Amaze Berlin, uh, I think it's a, one of the best uh, indie festivals in Europe these days, it's very nice, if you get the chance to go, I would highly recommend it, here's a photo from it, where I showed Lime Molder for the first time, I think, uh, well, not quite the first, but yeah, and uh, I had to go overhead here, so it was awkward to play as well, so you have to kind of uh, arch your neck backwards and uh, try to not lose track of where you are. It's pretty cool. Um, you can also show it, show your games at non-game -spe specific stuff. So this was in Romania um, at a music festival. So like music uh, festivals and like rhythm or visual games work really well together. And a lot of uh, festivals w warm up to like these weird games these days. So you can can show it at like this different locations. And it, they made it look really cool as well with these blue lights. Qu quite happy with that. Or you go all out and show it at like weird locations like uh, Burning Man. That was last year. Um, I, uh, they, they contacted me, actually. It was a small camp. I think I need to, sp oh, do I need to speed up? It was good, all right. Um, 
well, let's tell some stories. <laughs> um, so this was an LED dinosaur camp, and they said, oh, we do LED dinosaurs. So they had like this LED skeletons you can't even see in them in this picture. But they found this, oh, you have an LED game. Let's kind of do it together. And um, it was kind of cool to show it there, but most people didn't expect there to be games. Um, so uh, it was kind of an unusual environment. But uh, it turns out uh, blinking LEDs are really good fun if you're high on LSD. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone told me anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's one of those guys. Um, but yeah, it was also a really good stress test because like the sand there is like super, uh, super uh, basic. So like the opposite of acidic. Um, alkaline. alkaline, yes. Um, so it kind of makes everything rust immediately basically. And uh, you know, like your skin starts to crack and uh, bikes break down. It's, it's amazing. Um, but uh, my game survived, luckily. Um, but I need to, you know, I need to properly clean it with alcohol afterwards and all this stuff. Uh, but it was fun to show it there. But it's maybe like a weird environment to do it in. Um, yeah, I think that's almost it on the exhibition side. There's like a couple more art spaces that show things like this. Uh, some in London, Novelty Automation, the very politically inspired uh, arcades, uh, National Video Game Arcade in Nottingham. Um, different ones, Maker Fairs are pretty cool. Um, Music festivals, I went through most of those. Okay, so finally, um, what do you do with a game once you have it? I mean, there is a few ways to show it. So um, I, uh, there's like basically three ways, I would say. Like a small scale installation art, that's what, I, what I'm going for. So like you have, a, you have the game and you show it maybe at a few events, maybe at museums, festivals, but you don't really sell it as a consumer product. Um, um, that kind of works. Um, the, uh, I mean, it depends on your game, obviously. But for example, for Line Wobbler, um, I got a few requests from museums, and when they have temporary exhibitions, say on interactivity or uh, kits and games, um, they love this kind of stuff. This is very simple to play. It looks fantastic, um, and they usually they, they pay a, a fair bit of amount of money. I mean, it depends on what thing it is. But for me, for example, it was I don't know between two hundred and five hundred pounds for an exhibition, um, but it's a rental, so you get it back afterwards. So it's kind of, uh, as long as your game doesn't break, it's, it's uh, yeah, you get just get the money. Um, so it's good, uh, but I mean, there's, there's not a lot of those exhibitions, so it's not really a way to live off. Um, there's Kickstarter, um, so the Beast of Balance guys did that, so they have mass produced it in China, uh, but that's a whole different uh, beast, so to say. I mean, like, you need to probably get lawyers, you, you need to find a factory in China. You need to find the second factory that doesn't try to rip you off. <laughs> Probably the third one that does it properly and then uh, shipping and handling and all this stuff. None of this is things I'm interested in, but they do exist. And you can also license it out. So you, you sell the idea basically to toy companies. So I know, for example, Hasbro is interested in these kind of things, but they would like to combine it with existing IP. So for example, if you can make a Star Wars line wobbler or something, then they're happy. But otherwise, it's, my game is too abstract for them. And I think, I, I don't know the numbers, but you get a small percentage of the sales, or depends on your contract, I guess. I haven't, uh, haven't really followed up on them, but it's like, you know, 3% or something of the sales, which is a lot, actually, because you don't need to make any of the hardware. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe it might be different. Um, yeah, so this is actually the knife game I told you about. Um, so you see, this is a fr French kitchen knife, and it's a collaborative game. You need to press buttons, and if you if you kind of... Uh, if the knife comes close, you need to jump over the, bl the blade, basically. Uh, and it's like different levels, and it gets more erratic later on and more aggressive. And it's a little display that kind of taunts the player, saying, ah, oh, you meaty uh, scumbag, I don't know. No, I didn't say that, but I uh, <laughs> can't think of proper insults right now, but uh, it's mostly punny. Um, but yeah, that's it. So um, they're, you know, hardware games, cutting edge, <laughs> very niche. <laughs> Um, but they're getting more recursion now, so there's like more places to show them. There's uh, slowly becoming some ways to sell them or um, get them out there. Um, but yeah, still very much a hobby thing. But it's easier to do them now than ever. You can get started just like, you know, by buying a cheap $5 set on eBay and that's it. And uh, that's all. Yes, thanks. So, so